that we are part of something bigger that is getting bigger. We're a global community with local flair. There's a quick thing I want to do because we're a global family. We're going to send love to our northernmost chapter in Thronium, Norway. They are celebrating their second anniversary. So Cliff, if you'll send a heart sign, a peace sign or something, he's going to take a picture of the audience. And we're going to send it to that chapter. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We're here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connection and learning from others in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and in purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Blogging University gives you a free step-by-step -step guide by the WordPress code. And thank you to Princess Thread. I saw, I think, is that here? Justin. Justin. Hey, Justin. So we want to say thank you to Princess Thread. Thank you for believing in the magic of this community and for championing creators across the city. You're welcome. Because Creative Mornings Fort Worth wouldn't be possible without our local And in the, in the spirit of kind of feeling more connected with you, I'm not going to use a mic, but can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. Uh, well, my name's Sarah Sampson, and uh, I'm so thrilled not only for the city of Fort Worth, but for all of us in this room to get to connect in this way around creativity. And I know that a lot of these talks start with kind of like my to-do list, the stuff that I do. And if I were to give you some of that, um, I'm the social emotional learning facilitator for a school district here in Texas, Keller ISD, which means that I spend every day with, uh, with kids in our generation trying to figure out how we can build their human skills, yeah, make them feel more connected in this world. Um, I also lead something called ecstatic dance here in Fort Worth, which I'll be telling you more about. But what I actually want to do is I want to get out of my to-do list. And, and the last thing I want to do is give you a to-do list on how to be more creative. Because what I'm more interested in is getting us kind of unplugged out of the mind and actually throw that to-do list out there in the botanic gardens somewhere and uh, think about what it means to be creative in an embodied way, yeah? Which is really just a fancy way of saying getting into the body and out of this, this hamster wheel of the mind. Um, as a creative, the mind has often not been my friend in my creative projects. It's full of self-doubt and negative self-talk and what it should look like, or worse, what they think it should look like, yeah? And I'm gonna be totally honest with you. As I was trying to put together this talk, I wanted so badly to like rehearse it and have something perfectly constructed for you, and I just couldn't do it. And so I'm standing in front of you with an unrehearsed 
way of speaking, so it might not be linear. I might not move directly towards some goal because I'm not interested in creating that way anymore. I'm interested in creating in a way that's totally present, totally in touch with what's happening right now and what's happening right out here with you. So if it's a little bit cyclical in nature, stay with me, because this is how we flow, yeah? So in the nature of that, and because I need it too, um, my mind is having a really hard time with the fact that I didn't rehearse. It's telling me I'm going to fail. It's telling me I'm going to say something really stupid. It's telling me that at some point I'm just going to break and stand in front of you and that might happen and that will be okay. But my body, my body, my heart's beating, I can feel my knees locking a little bit. And if I attend to it, it's here and that's it. So I'm going to have us take a moment to get all here. Yeah, so if you want to just like uncross your legs, put both your feet on the floor, set your coffees down, and we're just going to sit for just a second and see how here, how in this room we can be. So go ahead, just you can close your eyes or, or stare at the floor if that's more comfortable for you. And start just by noticing your feet. See if you can spread your toes and your shoes, feel those there. Notice your knees, your hips, the places that you're touching the chair. Notice your hands, are they, are they gripped or holding on? Could they wilt like flowers? Could they relax? Your shoulders, could they relax a little further away from your ears? Your belly, could you take in a big deep breath? Inside out. We got more in there. Deep breath. Sigh it out. <sighs> Nothing to do. Everything to be. Notice your jaw. Is your jaw tight? How's your tongue? Could it relax in your mouth? The places between your eyebrows, could they relax a little bit? And now just notice your body. Notice it being all here and seeing it if there's any place where you could just relax a little bit more deeply into the experience of right now. And then we'll take in just one more big deep breath in together and we'll sigh it out. And you can go ahead and just open your eyes and know that being the human being that you are, you're gonna think about a zillion things between right now and when I finish this talk and that that's okay. But if you can, see if you can come back to this body, to this body that's right here and right now. Now the thing about the mind, which takes me in all the many directions away from myself, the body, which is connected to the five senses, is eternally present. It's eternally right here. And this makes sense. We know this, right? That the five senses exist right here and right now. I mean, I can't smell tomorrow. I can't taste yesterday. It's not possible. So when I tune into my five senses, I get this like express track to the present moment. Because what I can touch and what I can smell and what I can hear and what I can see is now. It's in touch with life. It's in touch with what's real. The mind itself for me is constantly projecting, constantly creating something. And it's hard to be in touch with my real, true, raw, creative, authentic self when I've got this chatter that's constantly trying to create something better, more interesting for you. Now, I consider myself a creative, and I consider my greatest project, like most of you, um, the one that takes my most attention, the one that's my full-time job to be the creation that is this, that is myself, that is my life. But if you would have asked me, few years ago, about five years ago, how I was creative and what was my creative life, I would have told you that I was an actress. And that would have been true. That would have been really, really true because I was doing something like five shows a year. But that is not where you would have seen my best performances. You would have seen those at your dinner table and all my romantic relationships. <laughs> yeah, just faking it everywhere, y'all everywhere, because I really did think that I could create something, that I could stand in front of people and, and whatever I could construct for them would be far more beautiful 
far more interesting than just showing up as yourself. Now, I have a friend who's in this room who spent quite a good a bit, bit of time with me post-college, and he actually drew me this diagram, this, this great and wonderful diagram, which I encourage you to create for yourself someday, where he had my name in the middle, and then around this diagram, he had all these different characters I played. And they were all resting in different contexts. You know, I had my yoga friends, my theater friends, my work friends, college friends, family, high school. And he showed me the different mask I put on in all these places. And he asked me, all right, so which, which one of these is you? I was devastated that I could not answer that question. And it sent me on a chase to find myself. <laughs> I picked up yoga, I picked up meditation, I traveled to Japan and cleaned toilets in a monastery, I went through all of Europe with a backpack and talked to every stranger I could find, I went out to the jungles of Peru and fasted for many, many weeks. And it wasn't there that I found myself on that chase, because it turns out, of course, it was like right here, all along in this body. I found myself, or rather, uncovered myself, remembered myself, revealed myself on a dance floor, okay? Now, and before this, my friends, I did not consider myself a dancer. Even being involved in theater, um, I was one of those people who we'd have to do a dance call and you'd have to go and, and do these moves and I just, uh, it, was never, it was never it for me to dance. I did not consider myself a dancer. And lots of people come to me now with that thought, that mind thought, I'm not a dancer. Everyone's a dancer, spoiler alert, just like everyone is a creative. So I find this thing called ecstatic dance, not to be confused with exotic dance, with I, which I hear a lot, <laughs> not to be confused, ecstatic dance. Yeah, and I think I found it somewhere uh, in the, the yoga meditation world, someone guided me towards ecstatic dance, and I show up, and ecstatic dance, it has these, these agreements that go along with it. So the first thing that you agree is that you're gonna be totally sober. You're gonna be intoxicant free, which for a lot of us is like, but I can't dance <laughs> if I don't have that part. You're trying to get real, yeah? You're trying to be with yourself in this practice. Uh, you agree to take your shoes off, which I'm gonna do right now. Be in touch with the floor. You agree that you're not going to talk when the music starts. And I understand now that this is because talking is like also a good highway up to the brain, right, and out of the body. So I get to this ecstatic dance floor, and the first thing I do is I just kind of stand on the edges and I observe. And what I see is all these people moving without a care in the world, eyes half closed, totally lost in the music. They're not dancing for me. They're not dancing for anyone else. They're dancing just for the fun of it. And I thought, yeah. That looks good. So I, you know, I jump out on the dance floor and immediately, in the mind, I'm like, um, okay, I don't know how to dance. Well, I know this move. I'll just do this move for a little while. Okay, I ran out of that move, all right. <laughs> that girl, she can dance. That's interesting. Ooh, look at that guy. He can't dance, right? <laughs> so the mind, it's like, it's judging, it's constructing, thinking about how it should look. It took me many, many, many times showing up to this ecstatic dance thing where I finally got it, right? That if I got totally out of my head and I just let that part go, and I really just listened to the music, and I really dropped in, that my body knew exactly what to do. If I just allowed it to move, what came out was something that was true and raw and real and beautiful. And it wasn't for anybody else. It was for the joy of it, for the pure joy of simply creating and moving out of something that was real, not constructed, not made up, yeah? So I kept showing up, I kept dancing, I kept moving, and what I found was that there was a lot in there, right? There was a lot underneath all that. And Gabrielle Roth, who we'll talk about in a moment, who really created kind of the context for ecstatic dance, she says, between the toes and the head is a million miles of unexplored wilderness. And it's true. And things that were coming up were big, big emotions, big thoughts. When my mind became clear and my body became open, I was receptive to all these things about myself. And some of them were not cute, y'all. 
right? The parts we want to hide coming up. All those masks, trying to integrate them into something that was real. Yeah. So keep dancing, keep moving. And my life started changing. I would come out of dance and I'd want to write and I'd want to draw. I'd want to call my mom and tell her that I loved her. My life became a lot less rehearsed because I noticed that just like on the dance floor in life, if I could get out of my head and just listen to what was happening, I could flow with it. I could move with it, yeah? Now, what I was accessing, I'm realizing now, is something that has already been termed flow state. You might have seen some of this. There's, a, there's been a book written about it. Psychologists have actually studied what they call peak experiences. And often these peak experiences, these flow states, they find in creatives who are so totally engaged with what they're doing that they lose track of time, they lose sense of self. They're totally embodied in that experience, yeah? But what I'm getting interested in now is how do I stay in that state when I'm not on the dance floor, when I don't have a paintbrush in my hand? How do I stay there? How do I make that my life? If my artwork is this, how do I stay in that authentic flow in my conversations, in my romantic interactions? How do I stay real? How do I stay present? How do I stay listening in that creative mode? So ecstatic dance, it's an hour and a half, okay? And you follow this journey, this arc from beginning to end. And this arc, this journey is a map that was created by this woman named Gabrielle Roth. And it's a map that you know so well. It's the map of beginning to end, morning to night, birth to death. It's the map of life. It's the map of creation. So the first rhythm, the first rhythm, whether we are waking up, whether we're starting a project, is the rhythm of flowing. And flowing is the rhythm of birth. It's inhale, soft, warm edges. It's the beginning, the inspiration, the blank canvas, the first sentence on that beautiful white page. It's when you meet that guy in the coffee shop, yeah? It's pregnant and full of potential. It's connected to the feet, the foundation. It's soft, round. Flowing, yeah? Now flowing, you can't stay there even though we want to, right? Some of us love the beginnings of relationships. We love starting projects. But we've gotta get clear. We've gotta move into the second rhythm, staccato. Now staccato is about definition. It's exhales, it's adolescence, it's hips, it's elbows, it's jagged edges. It's where we start to get defined, make clear, bold choices, black, thick marker on the page. In that relationship where we say, hey, so uh, what are we doing here? <laughs> right? We're making choices. It's experimental. It's edgy. Yeah? Whew, staccato. The music here is often sharp, hard. Now we can't stay here, can't stay here either. We move into what's called chaos, which is where the inhale meets the exhale, where the head surrenders to the feet. It's uncontrolled, it's wild. It's the place where we start to shatter ourselves and what wants to be created gets to move through. Where we've wadded up a thousand drafts and thrown them in the trash can and suddenly we're throwing red paint on the canvas and our relationship is breaking down and we're not sure what wants to happen but something is happening. Now a lot of us can get caught in this chaos, right? The mid-noon traffic, yeah? And a lot of us avoid this chaos. We want it to end but if we can stay with it, what comes on the other side is lyrical. Maturity, the kinetic movement of something that was broken open, flows out effortless. The breath is easy. Yeah, this is where we step back from the canvas and make polishing touches. That point in our relationship where things start to get comfortable, easy, 
So we know how you like your eggs. You can make them just how you like it. It's simple. It's easy. It's also the beginning of the end. The beginning of letting go, it's in the fingertips. And even here, we can't stay. We move into the rhythm of stillness, which doesn't come all at once. Stillness, the end, death. Now in our projects, this is often the hardest one for us as creatives to arrive to, to say, I'm done, I'm complete here. The final draft, the putting the paints away and saying this is complete. And relationship saying, I'm finished, we're finished. Now a lot of times we avoid this part. We don't want to arrive at the end. But the truth is that in the cyclical nature of life, if we don't come to an end, we can't begin again. This is how life flows. This is how life moves, right? In order to keep this wheel moving, we have to keep flowing with the impermanent nature of things. Now, the truth of dance and of life and of any creative project, any relationship, anything you bring your whole self to, is that there's gonna be songs, there's gonna be parts that you're like, yeah, my body knows just what to do in this moment. I like it, it feels good. And the truth is that part will end. And there's gonna be parts that are really hard, that are difficult, that we want so badly to end. And there's comfort in knowing, right? That will end too. So how do we stay with the parts that feel good and stay with the parts that are difficult knowing that they're impermanent and knowing that they're moving and changing, yeah? So the rhythm of dance, staying present and embodied with the changing nature of creativity is what I'm curious about. I did return to theater just a month ago, yeah. And you could not write this stuff. I did a play that was a tribute to Gabrielle Roth. I don't even know how this happened. It was wonderful. And I showed up on stage and instead of trying to figure out all the many things I could cover myself with, I tried to see how much I could strip down. Because here's what I know when it comes to creativity, if I can really stand in front of you and show you me, there might be something here that can connect with you because that's what's real and that's what's true, yeah? And so my, my challenge for you now, my friends, my creatives, is that you see just how much of yourself, fingertips to toes, that you can bring to your creations. Can you be all there to your, your writing drafts, your work projects, your relationships, your conversations, your morning cup of coffee, knowing that everything is an opportunity to be a creator. And every moment is an opportunity to stay in the flow of the ever-changing rhythm of life. This life, this beautiful work in progress, it's not something we're supposed to be audience members of or directors somewhere off there barking orders. We're supposed to be active, alive, flowing, and creating. what I got. <laughs> Someone's got a question. I just threw a lot of crazy on you. <laughs> um, I'm just curious if since you've uh, been kind of away from this process and you've been teaching and things like that, have you um, experienced grief through loss? And what's more interesting to me is how has it been different for you? 
Mm, goodness, sister, you're so alive with that question. Um, you know, I've been playing with this idea that, you know, waking up is letting go, right? That the process of life and being with impermanence is that we're constantly, constantly letting go. You know, we can't get attached to anything because it's just going to keep changing. And the beauty of impermanence is that nothing lasts. Also, the pain of impermanence is that nothing lasts. And the beauty of the pain of impermanence is that even the pain of impermanence won't last. <laughs> right? And there's something about grief, too, that I'm realizing as well, is that it totally empties you, right? When you experience real, true grief, it washes through you so big and so real that all those little things, all those little BSs that you once cared about, pfft, they don't matter anymore. And so when it comes through you and it totally cleanses you out and you move through that whole process, knowing that that grief itself is impermanent, on the other side is that real, deep, true emptiness. Right? And I don't mean emptiness by lack of anything. I mean emptiness is like kind of this great open vessel, right? That could now allow anything to enter. So what, what you're asking about the connection of grief and moving through that, the, the act of moving has been incredibly important for me to be able to let things go, if that's helpful. I work with K through 12. I got the full gamut. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you take what you've learned and infuse that to your children and children. Hmm. Yeah. So social emotional learning, um, it's built off these five core competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, uh, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And the idea is that if we can get children out with those things, it might not matter how much information they know. And so as much as possible, my hope is that we can move education out of so much of the head. You know, we need some of this. We need a lot of this. But how much can we give them the skills to be able to be resilient and thrive in life, which sometimes takes being able to move with life's challenges. Um, so for social emotional learning, a lot, of my, a lot of my love and a lot of my goals is to be able to build that resilience in children that whatever life throws at them, they can keep moving with the wave because they know themselves. Right, because they, they have tools to manage what's coming at them and they have such good social connections and ability to be with themselves and others that they can make it through this life in a good way because at the end of the day, um, I think we're, we are and should be far more concerned with that than um, what they made on their, on their star test. So, okay, yeah. This is a big wave that's moving through. It really is. So um, Keller ISD is one of the first in Texas who's taken this on. Austin ISD started it first in Texas, and it started out in Oakland ISD in California. And um, the movement itself is, has a lot of momentum behind it because they're actually noticing, get this, that if we really care about the social emotional health of our students, their academics go up. <laughs> yeah. Children learn when they're, they feel safe, seen, and heard. They do. And their emotional outbursts, their discipline issues going down. And so this is really spreading in a big way. And um, you'll start to see this, I believe, popping up all over as we start to learn that in an increasingly digital world, we don't need more, more, more information. We need more, more, more connection. So this will only grow. on all of us, my friends. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, great question. Um, one of the things that's interesting about ecstatic dance is you're not allowed to have your phone in there, <laughs> obviously, because, you know, that's like also my fast track to my mind. It's also my fast track to projection, right? Like, that when I talk about like constructing something that's more beautiful and more interesting than who I am, I feel like that's what I'm constantly trying or having to do on social media, which is really difficult. And we know that this generation of kids who's in school right now, they call them the I generation. Like I'm sure you can guess why. Um, but they're showing that they're uh, a little bit more stressed than previous generations. They're less happy, something like 50, uh, if you spend 
an hour or more on social media, you're 56% less happy. Wow. And they're also more socially isolated than ever before. And um, they've got a lot of other things going for them, like they're the most tolerant and acceptant generation in previous histories, and they're highly creative, and they're highly intelligent. So there's a lot going on for them. But this challenge, and it's not isolated to our I generation, it's, it's, it's us too, um, this challenge of social isolation, loneliness, stress and unhappiness that comes from this constant distraction, this constant in the mind, and this constant comparing and projecting is so, so difficult. And so these moments where I can go into embodied states like dance, it becomes a practice for me. It becomes a practice of staying in my authentic self and staying with what's happening in the world because a lot of times my choice to pick up my phone is to make myself feel better. Like I can post something and maybe I can get some attention or I can look at things and I can distract myself from what's actually happening in the rhythm of life that's right now. So it's my way to get out of the present moment and my way to try to construct an image that might make me feel better. But it's like fake sugar, right? You know, we end up craving more real sugar at some point, more real human connection. So it's all tied in, yeah. And we're all, I think, trying, we're all having to navigate this thing for the first time, and we're figuring out as we go, right? We're kind of like building the plane as we fly it, as we figure out how to cope with technology in a world where um, we so thrive on human connection. We're built for it. And so I think as much as possible, I would never tell a teen or an adult to throw their phone out the window, because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's, it's how can I use my phone to, to get me to those human connections, right? How do we create a Facebook event, um, get together some marketing so that we can all show up in this room together, right? <laughs> yeah. Are there places to do the dance? Yes, oh, thanks, great question, yes. So we dance every first Friday and third Thursday at Urban Yoga. It's a wonderful studio off 8th Avenue um, in sort of the Magnolia Southside District. Um, if you're interested, you can search Ecstatic Dance Fort Worth, and that would give you information on how to, how to come dance with us. Um, Ecstatic Dance Dallas is also a, a form that we're affiliated with, and they dance every Wednesday and every Sunday. So there's a lot of opportunities to dance. It's for all ages. You'll see little kids and even people in wheelchairs show up. It's not about being able to dance. It's about you know, just seeing if you, if you can move with yourself and be present for everybody. Should we get up and shake it out a little bit? You're like, oh, no. <laughs> you know what we might do is as we leave, we could put on some music. How's that? How's that? Any other questions before we wrap it out? This is one of my dancers, by the way, right here. Mike, yeah. <laughs> um, how did you get from the acting career to the, to the SEL? And Hmm. Doing that. Interesting, yeah. So I was studying theater and I um, ended up teaching theater and the first theater job I got was in an elementary school in Keller. And obviously you're not trying to get elementary school students to be Meryl Streep. Like, I mean, you're not trying to create excellent production. And what I was realizing was, oh my goodness, these children don't know how to talk to one another. And I was using characters and I was using expressive modalities to get them to open up and connect with one another. And so I was just playing a lot with using, using embodiment and interaction and expression to get kids to be with one another and, and in a lot of group process as well as interpersonal process. And what I was doing, I realized was like, oh, there's this thing called social emotional learning. And so when my, my job, um, Keller ISD opened up a social emotional learning position, I really got in through the back door because I, there's no formal study for social emotional learning at this point, it's really new. So I was like, here are the ways that I've been experimenting with getting children to open up and connect. And they were like, all right, let's do this. And so um, I've had to learn a lot as I go, but um, the, a lot of the beauty of the process work of theater, has anyone here done any theater, like study? Yeah, then you'll, you'll know a lot of it is about like actually trying to strip off as much as you can and get down to a neutral and then putting things on and trying out anger, trying out sadness so that you know how these things feel in the body and feel in the voice and you, you move to a state of self-awareness. 
where, where I got kind of stuck was realizing, oh, I can use that to like move out in the world in a way where I'm constantly faking it, right? Um, and the reason I gave up theater is because I, I attached a lot of my faking it to spending so much time in there. So it's been interesting and nice to come back and realize that it can be a choice to put something on, but you've got to know you're doing it so that you can take it off. Yeah. I hope that's clear, yeah. clear as mud. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> Have an awesome morning. Is there another announcement? Can I get one more shot with everyone like in tights? <laughs> Stand. <laughs> Thumbs up for our Norwegian friends.